Welcome to the lecture Sex, Love and Marriage in the course Narratives We Live By, which is part of the University Minor Culture and Cognition. Sex refers in the biological field to the way of reproduction, which exists in most of the multicellular organisms from the eukaryota domain. Fossils of sexual reproduction organisms are found from more than 1 billion years ago. The prokaryotes, the other two domains of life, bacteria and archaea, multiply by replicating their genetic material. The sexual procreation entails halving the genetic material and mixing it with others. There are serious costs to this. It is slower than asexual reproduction, green in this illustration. As in the asexual, each organism creates an offspring. And in sexual reproduction, the red here, each two organisms create one offspring. However, the efficiency of sexual reproduction is in the diversity it enables. So while in the asexual way, mutation, genetic mutations are random and adaptation is slow, in the sexual reproduction, the change is much more rapid. Another serious cost is the amount of energy spent on finding and choosing the right mate. It is around this issue of finding a mate, reproducing a young and sustaining them into adulthood that human culture mostly engages. Of these uh, three concepts, sex is essentially mimetic. It doesn't require the other two. Love is classically mythic because it, it focuses on the person, their emotions, problems, solution, the elements that occupy mythic cognition. The more obsessive versions can be parallel to motherly love, the milder version to friendship both known from animal behavior. Marriage is highly theoretical since it is based on an official culture, categorization of a couple as married or an individual as married. And married means one is registered in the database of married people. Regardless of what happens in the relationship, as long as this reality is inscribed in the exogram, it is real and existing. Each of these can exist without the other two. It is the combination that human Western culture insists upon, and it is sustainable, but also very challenging. The model that we have in mind for this institution, to which we either hold or which we resist, is traditional marriage, a man and a woman fall in love and get married. The man is the major provider. The woman is the main caretaker of the house and the children. Sex serves both for producing children and for enjoyment. A certain level of sexual loyalty is expected more of the woman. The relationship between the couple is involved, friendly and supportive. The decision to join this social institution is voluntary but prone to much social pressure. The actual choice of partner is personal. We expect public figures to more or less follow this model. I put these guys here, but I could have put here Kardashians, actors, prime ministers, presidents, or generally speaking, public figures. And they're all expected to follow this model and show us that they do. In the, in the postmodern society, we have an updated model, which builds on the traditional one, but allows other varieties in many of the components, for example, flexibility in the gender of the couple, of the participants, uh, gender roles are more flexible. We have egalitarian or more egalitarian economic responsibilities. Uh, we can have couples that are not married officially. Divorce is more acceptable. Single parenting is acceptable. 
overall, at least two of these uh, uh, sex, love and marriage components are there in most of these uh, upgrades. These are acceptable as models because they exist all the time, but was less accept acceptable as proper behavior in the past and sometimes was criminalized or entailed uh, a lowering of social status. Some more models that are now acceptable, which seem to run against the evolutionary incentive of sex, love and marriage are asexual marriages or vol voluntary childlessness. Of course, such phenomena in fact assert the model as long as they are only on the periphery. Polyamory uh, is also peripheral. People that officially declare themselves as belonging to this group and they're not young enough to still be in the stage of searching for the right mate. But funnily enough, the polygamist model is very visible in uh, past years, partially because of the television program, a reality program, and a few others like it, uh, that bring to the living room of our low and lower middle classes a model of marriage in which four women, or more women, not one, work to appease one man. This program must be quite popular as it has been there for years, and I would not be surprised if such a model will eventually be legitimized in the not so far future. Eva Iluz, the scholar you see here, is a professor of sociology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris. She devoted much of her work to study love from a sociological perspective, thus not cognitive, not psychological, not semiotic or literary analysis, but a sociological Marxist, I would say, analysis. She talks about neo-capitalism that presents a model which focuses on individuality and insists on the combination of spontaneous love that brings happiness and that will be constant in the marriage. In order to achieve this, romantic love became an industry, providing consumable services that help keep up this model, such as costly signaling in its inception, that is the wedding, costly maintenance, and costly stabilizing or repair, repairing procedures. And to visualize this a bit, the costly signaling inception, the wedding, has to be as expensive as possible for the people involved. Maintaining an actively ha active, happy life as a couple since simply okay is not uh, recommended. So here investment goes into maintaining a youngish look, a construct, as it is not really youngish look, uh, an in love mood, which we would constantly have by relaxing or seeking fun in other ways. If something is not happy, that means that it's not working well. We invest in fixing it so, so that we can get back into uh, our happy state. And finally, the idea that all this happiness can happen spontaneously if we just pay enough for it. As you see here in a picture from a program of traveling to Russia to get uh, the love of your life, uh, one of many similar TV reality shows, the chance of real love developing there is quite small. And the culture blindness on the part of the American who cannot see the agenda of the Russian woman, and I'm not saying that she's necessarily planning to deceive in any way, but she's definitely not spontaneous. So this is Eva Ilu's take on the sociology of love. Uh, let us now look at some non-Western examples from the anthropological field as they are worked into Western media, the BBC and the CNN. So here, um, 
three clips from the BBC program, which of course will in the end reaffirm the Western, the Western agenda. The first clip is about arranged marriage among the Maasai. The Maasai are an ethnic group uh, from East Africa. The conversation with the young Maasai women is about arranged marriage, about their role not to disappoint their husbands, so to have sex with them, but also to meet with their boyfriends. But this should be hidden from their husbands. So here is the first clip. Dion is just as baffled by the idea of an arranged marriage. So now that, that, that you're married and um, and you, you, you have sex with your husbands, but none of you have children, huh? I do definitely feel that it's a it's a commune. It, it definitely it is a community. And even you know when I when I when I arrived and they welcomed me within like a matter of days, they were saying you know we really like you and we want you to be Olu Dorup. Um, sixth wife and they they weren't joking they, and they couldn't understand why I was saying no 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 I'm really not interested um, and and they're, they're all really happy with it and they're all really happy raising each other's children and, and hanging out and there's very little animosity between them obviously yeah they do have their arguments I mean I've seen a couple of arguments but the next day they're still there chipping in doing their chores and and they are they, they work live and 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 love together as they define love that is the second video is also from the BBC program about the Maasai. Here we learn the advantages of being the first wife living in a brick house uh, when all the other wives don't have a brick house yet and uh, managing the other wives. <laughs> Nala Mala wants to convince Dion of the benefits of polygamy. So she takes her to meet Ali Darab's first wife, Nanakwa. As the most senior wife, she lives in relative luxury. You ever get jealous of the other wife? No. Nobody get jealous. Do you ever argue with them? Nobody get jealous. I don't know if I'm going to get jealous. 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 I don't think that they really define love in the same way that that I would, um, because they're so accepting of, of 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 the way that it is. Like it's almost like one extreme and another. Because maybe when you know when I'm when I'm in love and and how I would define love is that I've actually put too much attachment to it. And whereas they put none to it really, or certainly no feeling to it. Like even when we were talking with some, some Morans earlier on and it was just like, you know, do you kiss and hug your girlfriends? They were like, no. And I said, so, you know, what do you do with them when you meet them? We have sex, but they don't kiss them or hug them. And it's just like, wow, you know, so, so again, that whole, you know, the, the, for me, when you love someone, in some sense, it's kind of more about that. <laughs> The
the third video could be a bit uh, difficult to watch. The journalist of the BBC certainly found it difficult. Uh, it is about a marriage forced on a very young woman, a girl in Western culture, who is devastated and cries in a heartbreaking manner uh, throughout the preparation and being led to her husband in the other village. She's already run away from home twice to avoid getting married. So her family try to pretend that it's not in fact her getting married, but another girl. Kaumbe though is still suspicious. She needs to be prepared for her wedding. To do that, her family need to get her into the hut. Her father steps in to try and persuade her. A quick shower finally drives her inside, where her family can get her ready. Whereas a boy becomes a man when he gets married, a girl only becomes a woman when she has children. The men wait outside while the women prepare the bride. After a quarter of an hour, Kaumbe is ready to be taken to her husband. The wearing and ceremonial casting off of a father's shoe symbolizes the bride leaving her father's house. But Kaumbe is still trying to resist. For Yvonne, it's almost unbearable to watch. Kaumbe is taken to her new husband's homestead a few miles away where she will stay for the next few nights before returning to her parents. I think it's appalling, absolutely appalling. I think the parents have handed over parental responsibility to, to a man and the, uh, the emotions of their child and the, the care and the... It's just awful. No words can describe how I'm feeling at the moment. Arranged marriage, polygamy and forced marriage are not acceptable in the Western schemata for this cultural institution. More important than teaching us about the customs of exotic people in Africa is the mediating of the British journalists. The two journalists 
exhibit emotional shock from the customs of these others and explain what is so difficult for them and how they think things should be. In the end, the message of these programs is to reaffirm to the westernized audience their own schemata, the Western ones. The fourth video shows a case of polyandry, a woman married to two men. The CNN journalist is not going into much emotional ado, but explains the primarily economic reasons behind the custom. Amar and Kundin are brothers. Now in their 40s, they have lived together almost their entire lives in the hills of Hamachal Pradesh. They share just about everything, their work, their home, and a wife. Tell me about your wedding day. We have a simple wedding, Kundin says. There is a bride and a groom, and the younger brother is simply attached to the elder brother. And this is their wife. Indira Devi. The trio have worked side by side as husbands and wife for more than 25 years. It's been going on for ages. My sister-in-law has two husbands. My mother-in-law also has two husbands, she says. It's called fraternal polyandry, where the brothers of one family are all married to the same woman. It's not common in most of India, but still flourishes in remote parts of the Himalayas. There are about 200 families in this steep hillside village that function pretty much the same, although some wives have three or four husbands, depending on how many brothers there are. Typically, the marriages are arranged. What about love? Do you love both of these husbands equally, or was this just for tradition? I like both of them. I look at them the same. When I am troubled, I tell them to marry someone else. <laughs> but they won't. What they do want is children with their shared wife. This is a bit embarrassing, but how do you deal with sex at night? That we have to work out. We make shifts, change shifts, and sleep on alternate days, or else it won't work. Is it difficult to have to share a wife between the two of you? To run the families, we have to do this, overcome the hurdles, and we have to control our hearts from feeling too much also. But feelings grow, and so did their family. They have three adult children now, who all live and work together in the same house. Do you know which child belongs to which biological father? We tell the kids that both fathers are the same. The family doesn't know and doesn't care. The daily grind takes all their time and energy. In this difficult terrain with few jobs available and very little land to share, one of the reasons that polyandry is popular here is because of pure economics. The practice goes back centuries because land is so scarce in this hill country. If Amar and Kundin had taken separate wives, they might have had to split the family's little land. So they stick to tradition. Do you want this tradition to continue with your three children? Sunita's two brothers have already decided they will follow tradition and share a wife. My opinion is that in a family, there should be a joint system, he says. The joint system is very good. Family runs very well that way. To find one, they'll have to travel to another village. The gene pool here is too small. The villagers say almost everyone here is related in some way. There's another incentive for polyandry. For every 1,000 boys born in this region, there are about 850 girls. As education and India's rapid modernization seep into this hill country, though, its ancient traditions may fade away. Until then, Life for these villagers will be much the same as it was for their forefathers and mothers hundreds of years ago. Sarah Seidner, CNN, Himachal Pradesh, India.
So these were some anecdotal examples that divert from the Western model and being presented by them, Western schemata and ideologies are reaffirmed. This is a moment of socialization, one of many in human life. But what if we turn things around and look at the Western model as the exotic? After all, it is diverting from the majority of human societies. Joseph Henrich, professor at Harvard University, did exactly this. He looked at Western culture from an evolutionary perspective. He wrote a few books. The one here is The Weirdest People in the World, How West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous. The word weird here is an acronym for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, Democratic. The book looks at Western culture and economic success as it is rich and highly influential as an evolutionary phenomena and its version of Christian religion, the Western version of Christian religion, Catholicism, as the force behind it, not because it is the word of God more, more than other versions of Christianity or other religions, but because of a combination of strategies that proved particularly adaptable. Here is part of an interview with him conducted by Michael Shermer. And, and what problem are you trying to explain? You know, why the West, you know, accelerated beyond other cultures or, or, or whatever? Yeah, I mean, at the core of the book is really a, a book about psychology and psychological variation and how we should think about psychological variation. So one of the big ideas is that our, you know, as a cultural species, having evolved to have these large brains that are ready to, to drink in ideas from other members of our social group, uh, we can shape how we think and process in, uh, information. So that means that the institutions we're exposed to, the technologies, the languages, all shape how our brains develop ontogenetically. Uh, in an environment, and that leads to psychological differences. And then the question is, well, how do we explain, can we explain some of the big patterns? So that should take us to in variation institutions. So what institutions vary? I mentioned before that probably the most important of human institutions is the family. And so I began looking at how uh, different family patterns, different marriage patterns, so polygamy versus monogamy, or um, societies have cousin marriage, some have clans, Westerners have bilateral inheritance, so through both mom and dad, and how this shapes the social networks and then shapes the incentives people face. It leads to different strategies and different ways of organizing the world. So at a high level, it's saying we should pay attention to these things that shape our minds at particular institutions. The one that seems to play a big role in my story is the family. And so part of what made European societies unique is that uh, in the late, late middle, or in the early Middle Ages, late, uh, late antiquity, the Catholic Church began to demolish the complex kinship systems of Europe and break people down into monogamous nuclear families. Now, this took centuries, but at least parts of Europe had been broken down by a, about a thousand years ago, so, so a thousand AD. And that led to the development of new institutions, representative forms of government, individual centered law in the high Middle Ages. Uh, and then by the time you get further, you know, several centuries later, you begin to, you begin to see you begin to see innovation and economic growth begin to take off. So behind this is kind of an interaction between social structure and psychological change um, and creates fertile ground for the development of these other kinds of, you know, formal higher level institutions. I'm thinking of government here. Yeah, most of us today think of the nuclear family and monogamy as the norm, but as most anthropologists know, it's not the norm, although you have a section called something about uh, polygamy and the, and the problem of math. And as evolutionary psychologists point out, you know, when you have a a community in which a handful of men get most of the women, that leaves a lot of young men uh, without a female companionship and nothing else to do but, you know, cause cause problems trying to trying to uh, adjust that. How is it possible that a polygamous society can operate like that with so many unattached men running around? 
Well, I mean, what we know from the anthropological evidence is that uh, if you have a system where the wealthy men are taking a lot of the women, you end up with this large pool of men who, in order to uh, have a chance of getting into the mating and marriage market, they have to take risks. And there are locally socially acceptable ways to, to deal with that by raiding other groups or by going into war. Um, or sometimes you get these age set structures where as a young man, you, you don't have many ma mating and marriage opportunities, but assuming you get to be old enough, you can then become polygynous. So it's a kind of uh, deferral of gratification situation. So, I mean, 85% of human societies in the anthropological record allow men to take additional wives. Meanwhile, the, the opposite, polyandry, is relatively rare, where right. women can take additional husbands. And those societies are also intermixed with polygyny. Uh, so it's, there's a real asymmetry there. And I think that asymmetries are, you know, built into to human biology. Why was it Catholicism that first put the brakes on polygyny like that, polygamy like that? Uh, well, I mean, in general, there, there is variation amongst uh, society. So you have the, the emergence of these universalizing religions, say, in the in the 500 years before year zero, say, in, you know, uh, before the common era. And the way I think about it is we, we often look like in one of our Western models is we look for the genius or the heroic inventor work. So we tend to look for the, the, the people who figured it out through some kind of deductive and reasoning process. A kind of more Darwinian way of looking at it, a more kind of population thinking would be to say there's lots of different religions. They're all doing different crazy things. So uh, Zoroastrianism is encouraging incestuous marriage. So a lot of cousin marriage, brother, sister marriage amongst the royals. Um, uh, Islam eventually has, they constrain polygyny down to four wives. They have to be treated equally. Mm. But then they have an inheritance rule that says daughters have to inherit half of what sons inherit. Mm. Uh, and this leads to parallel cousin marriage. So you got to marry your father's brother's son if you're a woman. And that creates a whole different set of uh, kind of network dynamics. So, you know, and these different groups are just playing with them. They can't tell what the long term consequences are going to be. And one particular group, the, the branch of Christianity that led to the Roman Catholic Church, seemed to pick up a bunch of these. And one of them was uh, not only monogamous marriage, because this was common in the Roman Empire, but uh, no divorce, no marrying relatives, and in particular, and also no sex slaves. So Roman men could only marry uh, monogamously, but they could get divorced easily, and they could also have as many sex slaves as they could afford, basically. Everyone outside the Western world knows that the Western world is exotic, if they even bother to have an opinion about it. Let us now look into ancient stories and see whether the Western model works there or not. The stories we will study in the context of sex, love and marriage are the biblical story of Sarah in the house of Pharaoh. This will be done here in the lecture the marriage of Draupadi from the Mahabharata, and the dialogue between Gilgamesh and Ishtar from the Epic of Gilgamesh. The last two will be the focus of the presentations. The dialogue between Gilgamesh and Ishtar happen after Gilgamesh and Enkidu win over Humbaba, the ogre-like giant creature who guards the cedars in the forest. Ishtar, who is a mighty Mesopotamian goddess, falls in love with Gilgamesh and wants him to be her husband. In the Indian story from the Mahabharata, we will meet our heroes, the Pandavas, in Draupadi's Swayamvara. Draupadi is the daughter of the king Drupada, and as a princess, she has the right to the Swayamvara event, which is when the princess chooses her husband from among the many warriors that come to exhibit their power and ask for her hand. The Pandava at this period in the story, because of various reasons, are hiding and living in seclusion in the forest, but they do arrive in their reclusant's clothes, clothes of monks, to this event. Arjuna, a warrior who is now in the clothes of a monk, surprises everyone and enters the competition wins it and also wins the love of Draupadi. We are not going to do literary analysis of these stories, uh, not the artwork of the author. We are not going to do source criticism on the, uh, of these ancient texts. 
but we will be trying to recognize what are the schemata that frame these stories, taking into consideration that it is not the ones that we have. Even though in the case of the, of the Bible, our schemas could be the ones that develop later to our Western culture. Let us hear the story of Sarah, or Sarai, as she was called then, in the house of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a generic name for the Egyptian kings. And Egypt, Egypt was a great empire in antiquity, and the Pharaoh was a great king. Going to Egypt was going to the center of the empire, to where things happen and where richness is. There was a famine in the country where Abram was, so he went to Egypt to have a better life. The reading is from a YouTube channel called Allowed Your Bible. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe at toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So the story tells that Abram went to Egypt because of the famine, and that the ruler of Egypt, Pharaoh, took Abram's wife, Sarai. Abram was afraid that this was going to happen, so he asked Sarai to tell that she was his sister. And then when Pharaoh was informed about the beautiful woman that came into his country and took her for his wife, Abram received a lot of property, apparently in return for Sarai. Then the Pharaoh and his household began to be sick or plagued. And the Pharaoh made the connection with the new woman he brought in. This was apparently a wrong thing to do, as she probably is the man's wife. The Pharaoh was then angry with Abram for lying, returned him his wife, and sent him away in peace, not even asking for all the property back. So Pharaoh is not at all the bad person in this story. Apparently, it was the custom for the strongest, rich, richest men to take into their home the most beautiful women. If we remember what we know about the Gilgamesh story, in the beginning of the story, Gilgamesh was pointed out as a bad king because he was taking brides right after their wedding. Taking somebody's wife is exactly what Pharaoh tried to avoid, as he clearly understood that this was behind the plagues that hit his household. The story seems to be telling its audience how Abram came to have all these possessions. In fact, how cunning he was when giving away his wife like a brother does and getting the property which Pharaoh, who was rich enough, never bothered to take it back. Indeed, from this point on in the biblical story, Abram is a rich man. In what way is this story counterintuitive for us? It is not possible in our society that the formal documentation of marriage will not be needed when speaking of a woman's status. 
as our societies are organized in nation-state forms and are very theoretical. Also, polygamy is not acceptable in many societies around the world, certainly in the Western ones. A third issue different for us is the idea that we get plagued because of moral misdeeds. Nowadays, we tend to think that sickness comes from lack of healthy lifestyle and plagues are a result of not caring for the natural environment. And we sometimes frame this as a moral issue when personifying earth, nature, or animals. The COVID-19 was not yet put into this framework. But we wouldn't say that a household is struck by plague because the king mistakenly married an already married woman. As for the rich and strong taking the beautiful women, it is perhaps against our ideologies or our religions but we do acknowledge that such, such things happen and we sometimes even punish people for this. But when taking all the later cultural development and ideologies away, still the story tells about how a person cheated his way into property by selling off his wife. Apparently, this disturbed some social groups in the biblical culture and it is not so much the selling of the wife as the idea that Sarah, the mother of the nation, shared the bed of a man other than her husband. We see this, the fact that it was disturbing, in another version of the story found in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Now Abram, is not in Egypt, but in Gerar, uh, a Philistine place. And the king of Gerar is the one to take Sarah. This second story is different from the first in three things. First, God comes to the king in a dream and tells him not to touch the woman. So this issue is sorted. No sex with the king. Then Abram explains that Sarah is actually his sister on his father's side, not his mother. So this is also sorted. Abram did not lie. And the third point, the king gave Abram riches, not as payment for Sarah, but because Abram prayed for him and his and his household's afflictions, which were the bareness of uh, women and men in this case, were lifted off. So the second story corrects all the things that were found difficult for this group that created the second story in the first story. With regard to the second point here uh, of um, Sarah being the sister uh, of Abram, um, I want to mention here a custom that probably existed in the Hurian society. You can see where it is here. It's a society from the northern part of today's Iraq and Syria and from the 3rd millennium BCE. In texts found in the archives of the city of Nuzi, as you can see here, we learn of a special legal situation in which men adopt women as sisters and then marry them off. This is something that looks like what we would call today women trafficking. It was poor women who had to go through this in the Nuzi society, it was always the brother who gave someone else the brother rights uh, on his sister and was paid for it. And then the adopting brother would get the bride's money when he married her off. But what we don't have in the story at all is love, which is part of our modern schemata, an unavoidable part. And it is time now to explain your assignment for this week. For this week's assignment, you are asked to choose an episode from the reality TV program, Say Yes to the Dress, and analyze it in terms of first the schematas this episode follows, and then the message the episode conveys to their audience. The two should be the same in some aspects, but different in others. 
post a link to the episode uh, you choose in your video, either as background or in any other way, and say the name of the episode so that I can retrieve it if I want to. And see you all on Tuesday in the seminars.